And so too the global and the US economy, where people are increasingly confident about spending money in the months ahead. The Consumer Confidence Index in the US rose in August to a six months high, still down from recent years, but it's, on, it's an improving index. It suggests people will be shopping for things like cars, appliances, computers, and smartphones. Now, if you want a good gauge of the global economy, look at shipping. Maersk brought in more than $50 billion in revenue last year. It's got 700 ships sailing around the world, and it's expanding its fleet to include ships that run on low carbon uh, methanol at the moment. Vincent Clerc is the CEO of Maersk. He is with me now. That is the big ship behind you, sir, isn't it? That's the, the, the new ship. Tell me about it briefly. Yes, that's, uh, that's the last ship joining our fleet here. And uh, it's a real uh, interesting ship, both from a design perspective, but also, as you mentioned, because it is the, the fourth ship in the world that is enabled to sail both on traditional fuel, but also on green methanol, and, and, uh, and therefore reduce the carbon footprint of these activities significantly. How much does a ship like that cost? And how much more does it cost to operate over a traditional ship, if indeed it is more expensive? So a ship like this costs about $200 million, uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty much the same price, whether you're buying a traditional ship or, or a ship that runs on, on methanol like this one. The difference is really on the operational expenses. The green fuels cost between two and three uh, times the price of the traditional fuels. And this is where I think from a, from a total cost of ownership perspective, there is a need to supplement the work that has been done in, in making the fleet green with a real regulatory regime that makes it easier for consumers and customers to do the right choice. You see, that's the problem. It's the same in aviation. Everybody knows what needs to be done, but A, you can't get the SAF in sufficient amounts or the green fuel, as you put it, and B, who bears the burden of the investment to create the environment to make the fuel? That's true. Uh, that's exactly that's exactly the issue. Although we can see that uh, between uh, what has been done in the U.S. with the Inflation Reduction Act and the investments that are happening in China and renewable energy, we're going to see a lot of capacity of green methanol coming online in the coming years. So I think from a, both a ship availability and fuel availability, we're making uh, big strides. The problem that we have yet to solve is the problem of, of cost. And there the industry has actually made a proposal to the International Maritime Organization that if we can get accepted or if we can get something similar right. to what we propose accepted, then we can actually decarbonize this entire hard to abate sector. The, the other fascinating part is this, the economy is getting better and you're a barometer of that. Now, uh, container rates are, go, are, are steady and good. The volumes are good. Things, you are seeing an improvement in global economic growth at the moment. I think what we have seen throughout uh, the last couple of years is an incredible resilience of the global economy, even in the aftermath of, uh, of COVID. The expectations that there was for hard landings or recessions, whether it was in Europe following the invasion of Ukraine or in the United States, this has not materialized as we see, and we continue to see strong container demand, and we expect that to last probably through the year. And I, I, the, the Red Sea, you and I sir, have talked about the Red Sea and the difficulties there. I noticed today one of, uh, another ship is leaking oil. Not one of yours, I make clear, uh, but is leaking oil and there are, there, there, there are problems. How much of the Red Sea problems, I mean, you, you, it's sort of, you, you've managed to mitigate. You're sending ships different directions. You're doing other things. But, it, but the long tail of effect, how much is still having it? I mean, this is still a major effect. I mean, since the uh, since the globalization of the container, we have never had to live supporting global trade without having access to the Suez Canal. It's one of the most travel trade routes in the world, and it's been closed for the for the entire year. So this is still having a large impact. We have to say longer distances. It consumes more capital. It has inflationary pressure on our cost. So this is still having a, a large impact and there is no real sign of de-escalation in the situation of the situation on the ground with, as you mentioned, ships every year, every week still being subject to attacks. Uh, Vincent, um, uh, you know, CEOs are, are always, they can always see problems on the horizon. But at the moment, would you say you are comfortable 
about the trading position, about the situation for shipping at the moment, and that previous concerns have been to some extent allayed? For sure, the, 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 the concerns that we had of overcapacity have been delayed, but we also need to realize that hopefully the selling routes that we're having today are not uh, the, the new normal. And, and I hope that we will be returning to normal sailing routes in a foreseeable future and, and managing this and the unwinding of the the unwinding of the current situation is certainly going to be uh, very sensitive. And there we could still see quite a lot of volatility in the market. So in general, I think volatility is here to stay. And even if situation is more stable today than what it has been at many moments in history, we can see always that there will be certain things that will not make that last forever. Well, thank the CEO of the Port of LA because he's often on our program talking about trade. So thank him from on our behalf. And thank you, sir. What a gorgeous ship uh, behind. And we look forward to, to, to visiting it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time.